the lighting of the Christ candle, the psalmist declares, O oh, send out your light and your truth, let them lead me. In grateful hearts, we come to the altar of God and lift up our hearts with the light and the truth of God's love in Christ shining brightly in us.
show me in the opening litany. We are drawn to worship by a reality unseen. The one we call God is beyond human description. We come in awe to bring our hymns of praise. The creator of all things has given us light. We are amazed by the wonders surround us. We feel God's presence as we sing, praise, and offer thanks. We are summoned by one who is just and merciful. The ruler of all the worlds expects us to respond. How amazing that God chooses us as messengers. We know God is with us as we worship and work for God's purpose. And together, appear to us here, O God, for we need your assurance and blessing. We seek the strength to do what is right and just. We long to see you, but we know that God can see 
It's children's time now in our service. And if you look at this morning's bulletin, you'll see the, uh, the word right beside it. Harvest. This is the Thanksgiving season. It's a wonderful time of year. And in particular, there's uh, we live in a land of abundance with wonderful harvest uh, all around us and with an amazing amount of gifts from the earth and the fields uh, for us to enjoy every day. So we are grateful for living in this good land, for the Thanksgiving season, for the gift of harvest and all the good things that come to us from it. Well, I was looking at this word and it provides us with some other words that provide a uh, special meaning at this, uh, at, at this harvest time. If you rearrange some of the letters that form the word, that make up the word harvest, there are all kinds of words that, uh, that, that, that we, uh, come to mind, but in, there are three in particular that have special meaning for me as I think upon what harvest means and what it's about. So the word harvest, there's mess in it, and there's a T, and there's may, and there's nar, which spells star, but continuing on, there's also a V and an E. Starve. In our land of abundance, when we have so many good things to enjoy and food is available to us uh, from many sources, there are so many people in the world, uh, children and adults, who are suffering terribly, as we all know from all kinds of unfortunate reasons, whether it be famine, warfare, disease, you name it. Uh, life is difficult for many people, and because of it, many people are starving. And here we are living in abundance. And that brings to mind another word that I find in the letters that spell the word harvest. It is H E A R T, heart. And with those who have heart within them, they want to do something and care for those who are less fortunate than ourselves, who are starving and <coughs> suffering in various other parts of the world. And with a heart of caring, what do we do? Well, here comes the final word that comes to mind. It's, there's an S and an H, A, R, E. We share with each other. And with those around us who are not as fortunate as we are. And there's all kinds of ways by which we can share of ourselves. Um, if we have friends and neighbors or family members who are not feeling well, who are lonely or upset, we can befriend them, we can care for them, we can be present to them in all kinds of needful ways. There are those that we do not know in our community who also need help. And here's where our uh, kitchen of shelf sharing is such a needful and valuable part of our church life and giving our support to uh, this uh, local food bank that we have here. That is a way of sharing uh, with the goodness of our hearts. As well, there are, uh, there are ways and means within our church through uh, support of our church and mission and service through uh, charitable organizations of all kinds, like the uh, Canadian Red Cross. These are ways by which we can share of ourselves. And when we do these things, and many, many other 
ways and means by which we share. We are doing what we understand uh, through the life and work of Jesus Christ. We are doing our best to increase and improve um, uh, and, uh, and uh, establish uh, God's work being done in God's world as people of God. So when we think of on harvest, it's a good word um, and it reminds us of the, how fortunate we are and how well, through a, a good hearts and willing minds, we want to share what we have to support and care for those less fortunate than ourselves. And the service, uh, our children's time, continues with the, uh, with the prayer that our Lord taught us to pray. Let us pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And our children's hymn, which is becoming familiar to our children, and many of us have learned it from our own childhood, can a little child like me, come now to our time of offering. The offering places in our place at the back of the church and uh, 
please make use of them as you are able. Um, and now we uh, will continue with the dedication of the orphan, which is printed in the bulletin. This morning, I want to make you smile because one of us in this congregation runs a tax company, and the tax company is called Render Unto Caesar. <laughs> it's just a great name for a tax company. Don, you something else. <laughs> when the Pharisees went and took counsel how to entangle him in his talk, and then they sent the disciples to him along with Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are true, and teach the way of God truthfully, and care for no man, for you do not regard the position of men. Tell us then, what do you think? Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But Jesus, aware of their malice, said, why put me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me the money for the tax. And they brought him a coin. And Jesus said to them, Whose likeness and inscription is this? They said, Caesar's. Then he said to them, Render therefore to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God. When he heard that, a marvel. When they heard that, a marvel. And they left him and went away. May God bless to us this reading of his holy word, and to his name be all glory and praise. Our hymn, O for a World, number 697.
Let us pray. Loving God, allow us to sense your presence within and amongst us, that we may know that we are doing your will as your faithful people. Let your favor rest upon us, that we may extend your grace to all whom we meet. Amen. John was reading to us this morning's scripture lesson, it is clear that this was a trap, carefully thought out and well executed. The ones who put it together, the Pharisees and the Herodians, had little, very little in common with each other. They had no respect or regard for each other. The Pharisees disliked the constant presence and excessive powers of Roman rule in the land. The Herodians, as their name suggests, got along rather well with those who were in power. They were some of Herod's henchmen. The Pharisees and the Herodians were at opposite ends of the political and the religious spectrum. And here they are, working together, hatching a plot to trap this man Jesus, who was becoming an endless bother and a growing annoyance to them both. Now, we are beginning to see how threatening and dangerous Jesus was proving to be to those who lived and worked within the long corridors of religious and political power. Not only was he on their minds much of the time, by now he was really getting under their skin and disturbing their familiar and their comfortable lifestyles. So enough was enough. And these two powerful groups, miles apart from each other, were willing to work together to entrap them. To entrap them. They came up with a clever idea. They would throw him a question, a simple yes or no question, which would compromise, even discredit him, whichever way he chose to answer it. It was loaded. Whatever way he cared to answer the question, the answer would be incriminating, and they would finally have it on record and have some worthwhile public support in, um, in the process. I can see them grinning at each other, nodding approvingly, rubbing their hands gleefully as they walk out of their meeting, going on their way to find Jesus. It proved to be a perfect trap. Well, Jesus was not far away. He gathered, uh, there were a crowd of people gathered around him. And that's exactly what they wanted. The more people who were there to witness this confrontation, the better it would be. So, in this public setting, they approached Jesus and put the question to him. Teacher, tell us what you think. Is it lawful 
to pay taxes to the emperor or not. All of a sudden, then and there, the atmosphere, you can be sure, turned thick and heavy with tension. The people present would be on pins and needles, one, uh, waiting, wondering what on earth Jesus would say. If he said yes, the Herodians and their band of followers would agree, and all the others would be badly upset. If he said no, the Pharisees and many of the people in the crowd would quickly agree and cheer, and the Herodians would be angry. So how do you answer? How can you answer without causing an outburst of anger and trouble one way or another? Jesus knew it. He knew he couldn't fall into the trap of saying either yes or no. <clears throat> Putting some quick thinking into action, he looked around the crowd, the crowd standing around him, and asked for a coin. The accusers had lots of coins on them in their pockets. Scripture says that one of them gave him a coin which was used for tax purposes. Jesus took it. He looked at it and looked out at the people. He did not answer their question at all. Instead, he asked them an even simpler question. Whose head is on this coin? And whose title? The answer was obvious. And they quickly replied, the emperors. Then Jesus, staring at all of them, straight in the eye, gives them back the coin and says to them, in the hearing of everyone, so give to the emperor the things that are of the emperors and give to God the things that are God's. His answer stunned them. It stunned them. It left them speechless. In one little brilliant statement, <coughs> Jesus had just taken all the wind out of their sails, even on such a touchy politically charged, religiously sensitive issue as this, which his accusers themselves had framed so cleverly. Jesus had clearly beaten them to the draw. He had left no room for argument, no cause on which they could build a case against him. Scripture says that they simply left him and went away. I, I bet this time they were not rubbing their hands gleefully or grinning at each other. I can picture them suddenly departing company with their blood pressure and temperatures rising accordingly. Nevertheless, where does that leave us? Where do we go from here? Jesus said, Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. What does that mean? Does it mean that over here, on one side of life, we have the realm of God, that which is personal, private, spiritual, religious. And over here, on the other side of life, we have what belongs to the empire, the empire money, 
power of work, protection, defense, security. Is that how we perceive it? That everything which is really important to us, things that work that we work so hard to acquire and enjoy, really belongs to the realm of Caesar? If that is so, then there is not much room left for God, is there? If Caesar represents the acquiring of material goods and pleasures, and God connects with the growth of spiritual goods and services, I have an idea that Caesar wins. Caesar wins, hands down. Caesar is in command and has control. After all, Bay Street, Wall Street, Parliament Hill, the CRA, and the like are the power structures of nations and empires. So which is more important? Money talk? Or God talk? That's not a hard question to answer. In this part of the world, we take pride in the ways we govern ourselves as a democracy. Whatever are our problems with government, we really do not want to change the system in any kind of radical way. We prefer by far to live with the workings of democracy than we ever would in a system built and centered on a theocracy or an autocracy. Yet, for all the many benefits we have and enjoy in this democratically structured kind of life land of ours, I wonder if we too, I sometimes wonder if we too, are not victims of it. <clears throat> Capitalism can also act with forceful, heartless, and brutal strength. A free market economy set within a democratic system of power has many ways of enslaving many people. All of it wrapped up well in the wonderful notion of freedom and of flag waving. With democracy, of course, there is no Caesar, no emperor or dictator who are all powerful. You see, I think democracy can be more subtle than that and can sometimes be deceiving. Maybe in this good land of ours, we ourselves can rise up and be tyrants of our own, in our own way. It is only fair to ask the question, where do we draw the line between faithfulness to God and idolatry to empire? <coughs> it is a valid question, and it's not a very easy one to answer. I guess that and all uh, I guess that all we need to decide for ourselves, realizing that much of our decision making is set by the good things that empire can offer to us. So we act accordingly. We thank both Caesar and God for being able to live the best part of both worlds.
but before we leave for the dark, there's one more thing we need to consider and to do it carefully. And it has to do with image. Jesus took a coin and saw an image printed in it. He asked whose the image it was. And the people replied, Caesar's. Jesus agreed. But that's not the end of it. All through his life and work of ministry, Jesus would have seen many coins, all of them with the image of Caesar printed on them. So be it. Much more to the point is this. Jesus would look at people. He would look at them carefully, thoughtfully, perceptively, and he would see right there in front of him another image. It was the image of God printed not upon some form of metal that is perishable, but on a human heart and soul. And God's image said within the heart, human heart and soul, is imperishable. The image of Caesar is imprinted on coins. The image of God is imprinted in us. We make the distinction. We decide for ourselves. And we put it together according. And our thanks be to God. This morning's preparation for prayer. I waited, I waited on the Lord. It's number 954. We will sing, we will sing it twice.
There is no other. Created by you out of nothing, without you we return to nothing. You are the wind that lifts the wings of the birds. You are the wave that carries water to the sandy beach. You are the song that bears glad tidings of joy. You are the voice that whispers across prairies and mountains. These things we know, but there are times when we are battered by winds unbroken and flooded by waves untamed. We hear music that lulls our goodwill to sleep. We hear words that deceive us with the sweetness of honey. Then we can all too easily turn our loyalties to little gods. Broken by our fears, we kneel at the altars of power and wealth pride and ambition, privilege and self. We sometimes forget, Lord, that you have knit our limbs together and made our minds to dream. Reclaim us as your own and turn our little thoughts into higher thoughts of you. Let us see those little gods for what they really are. Lifeless puppets, sprawled limp on the ground, whose dance is dead without our help, whether it be willing or pressed upon us. <clears throat> but you, you are the one who dances unhindered despite all our attempts to pull your strings. We cannot, choreo we cannot choreograph your movements, O oh God. So teach us to be in step with you. Let us move according to your will, and we will be alive. Make us captive to your spirit, and we shall be free. The strings that bind us to the puppet god shall fall from our hands. Our arms shall reach up toward Christ's light, and your breath shall lift us up in flight. And we will know and rejoice evermore in the assuring truth that you are God and you alone. And we say, Alleluia. And all God's people say, Amen. Number 581.
understanding and of far more worth than any human reasoning. Keep guard over your hearts and your thoughts in Christ Jesus our Lord and the blessing of God Almighty, Creator, Christ, and Holy Spirit be with you this day and forever. Amen.